A warning for listeners. Throughout this podcast, we have audio from 9-11 itself, plus recreations of the day's events. It's important history to hear, but it can also be disturbing. A major storm front swept across the East Coast on the evening of Monday, September 10th, 2001. It brought behind it a high-pressure ridge of dry Canadian air that created a unique meteorological phenomenon that pilots call severe clear. What that meant was that when the next morning dawned, Tuesday, September the 11th, the sky up and down the East Coast was blue, bright blue. Firefighter Jay Jonas had worked the overnight shift with Ladder 6, his FDNY unit in Manhattan's Chinatown. It's like the air was scrubbed clean. It, it was, the sky was so blue it hurt your eyes looking at it. And uh, it's so, uh, it was so dramatic that uh, every time I see a sky like that, I call it a September 11th sky. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This message is for Norwegian passengers traveling on Norwegian flights. At Logan International Airport in Boston, passengers were trickling on to American Airlines Flight 11, a Boeing 767 scheduled to arrive at LAX later that morning. American 11 Heavy, thank you. Monitor to ground point nine, November skirt. We're going to need uh, runway four right today, American 11 Heavy. The plane left Boston at 7.59 a.m. with 92 people on board. The last word from the pilots came at 8.13 for a routine check-in. American 11 turned 20 degrees, right? Any right, American 11. Exactly what happened next is not fully clear. But within a few minutes, air traffic controllers noticed something was off with the flight. The plane now appeared to be flying low. Then it started banking to the right, veering off course. Controllers tried reaching the cockpit again. American 11, a climbing table level 350. American 11, uh, the American on the frequency, how do you hear me? American 11, Boston. At the time, plane hijackings were rare, but common enough that there were established response procedures that unfolded with a certain grim rhythm. To this point, hijackings had rarely resulted in civilian casualties, and never before had the hijackers ever actually commandeered the plane itself. So when traffic controllers couldn't hear back from Flight 11, initially, they weren't extremely alarmed. This is Boston. I turned American 20 left and I was going to climb. He will not respond to me now at all. Looks like he's turning right. Yeah, I turned him 20 right. Oh, okay. And he's only going to... uh, I think 29. Okay. Sure, that's fine. Roger. All right. Thanks. Around this time, flight attendant Betty Ong grabbed an air phone on flight 11 and got in touch with an American Airlines office on the ground. Ong told them that five men had jumped out of their seats in first class right after the fastened seatbelt signs turned off. They had stabbed three people, apparently with box cutters, on their way to seize the cockpit. And the cockpit is not answering their phone. And there's somebody staff in business class. Okay. At this point, this is operations. What flight number are we talking about? Flight 12. Flight 12. Okay. So we're on flight 11 right now. This is flight 11. It's flight 11. I'm sorry, Nadine. Ong turned and asked the other flight attendants if they could get through to the cockpit. But when the hijackers stormed the front of the plane, they must have sprayed something like mace in first class, Ong said. She was now huddled together with the other flight attendants in the back of the cabin. Our number one has been stabbed, and our five has been stabbed. Can anybody get up to the cockpit? Can anybody get up to the cockpit? We can't even get into the cockpit. We don't know who's up there. Moments later, around 824, air traffic controllers finally heard back from Flight 11. Is that American 11 trying to call? Somebody. We have some claims that stay quiet and you'll be okay. We are turning to the airport. And uh, who's trying to call me here? 
Nobody moves. Everything will be okay. If you try to make any move, you'll danger yourself and the airplane. Just stay quiet. With no idea of what was going on, they started asking other pilots in the airspace if they could see Flight 11. Roger, you have traffic. Look at your bro. 12 to 1 o'clock at about uh, uh, 10 miles southbound. See if you can see an American 767 out there, please. They were looking negative contact. Guys. Those in a nearby plane, United Airlines Flight 175, were also headed to Los Angeles, just minutes behind Flight 11. Remember this plane, United Airlines Flight 175. You'll hear more about it later. The pilots checked in with ground control. We heard a suspicious transmission uh, on our departure out of Boston uh, with someone, uh, Someone see the bike and said, uh, everyone uh, stay in your seat. Oh, okay. I'll pass it along over here. At 8.43, air traffic controllers finally pieced it together. They were witnessing a hijacked airplane headed for Manhattan. I have a situation with American 11, a possible hijack. American 11, he started to buy Boston, went to LAX. Right now he's stopped around and he let to scramble some fighters to go tail him. Those jets would never find their target. Just minutes later, at 8.46, American Airlines Flight 11 ripped through the clear blue sky over Manhattan. The plane crashed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center at 465 miles per hour. Everything I've just described happened in a span of just 47 minutes. In the middle of the worst ever act of terrorism directed at the United States on domestic soil. I'm Garrett Graff, a journalist and historian. I've spent most of the two decades since 9-11 covering the legacy of that tragic day, both the human experience as well as the way it changed our government and our society from the rise of Homeland Security and the War on Terror to its effects on our politics. I've written about the FBI's counterterrorism work, and in 2019, I published a landmark oral history of 9-11, the only plane in the sky that catalogs the voices of 500 Americans as they lived through that awful day. Along the way, I've interviewed the passengers aboard Air Force One with President Bush and the congressional leaders hidden away in mountain bunkers outside D.C. People at the Pentagon, inside the Twin Towers, and those on the ground in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. I've interviewed the FBI agents who spent the years before 9-11 trying to stop a group called Al-Qaeda and a man named Osama bin Laden, as well as the Navy SEALs who killed him 10 years later in Abbottabad. What happened on 9-11 and how it changed our world is the most important story of the modern age. It's the hinge on which so much changed. The dividing line between the 20th century and the 21st. But since I started reporting on September 11th and speaking to people across the country, I've realized many still don't know what happened that day. They don't understand how the events unfolded. Today, a quarter of Americans are too young to remember the attacks at all. And in chronicling how these attacks changed our lives, I've realized that the history we now teach of September 11th is a simple one. We recall the surprise attack that shot across the blue sky of the back-to-school September day. Buildings fell down. Flags popped up. Lives are changed. But that telling is too tidy. 
For those who lived through it, the chaos filled 102 minutes from the first crash to the final tower collapse were a mess of fear, chaos, confusion, and trauma. We didn't know when the attacks began. We didn't know when they would end. We didn't even know how many had occurred. And worst of all that day, we didn't know what would come next. In the years since, thorough, large-scale efforts, including a congressional inquiry and the famous 9-11 Commission, have tried to make sense of the events of that chaotic and tragic day. Many were quick to blame the success of the terrorist diabolical plot on failures of intelligence or preparedness. These public hearings are part of our search for truth. But 20 years after the attack, plenty of questions remain. This podcast is my attempt to answer some of them. The questions that we still puzzle over, debate, and discuss decades later. The same questions I hear almost every time I speak about 9-11. And their answers, in some cases, will surprise you. This is a different history of September 11th than you likely remember. But it's one that will help you make sense of the world the attacks left behind. From Long Lead and Goat Rodeo, this is Long Shadow, a podcast about the enduring mysteries and lingering questions of 9-11. Episode 1, How a Failure of Imagination, Institutional Bureaucracy, and Structural Failures in the Twin Towers led to thousands of unnecessary deaths on September 11th. The World Trade Center, when it was built, was the most ambitious set of buildings in the world. No one imagined they could fall. The complex's owner, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, declared upon their creation, we have a Gibraltar. So how did these iconic structures and architectural marvels fall so fast? Why couldn't more people have been rescued? And could some of those deaths have been avoided? For nearly four decades, the twin towers of World Trade Center 1 and 2 loomed over New York City. They defined the Manhattan skyline, 110 stories apiece, a quarter mile high, each floor a giant acre of office space. The towers were the centerpiece of what was in total a 16-acre site, made up of seven buildings above ground including a Marriott hotel nestled between the towers at their base. There was also an underground shopping mall and train station that served tens of thousands of commuters every morning. Some 50,000 people worked in the buildings and another 70,000 visitors passed through each day, shopping or taking in the stunning views from the top of each tower. Controversial when they were built, the Twin Towers became the biggest buildings in the world in the 1970s. Eventually, they came to be beloved by New Yorkers and instantly recognized around the world. As James Glanz and Eric Lipton wrote in their 2003 biography of the buildings, the World Trade Center Towers were the biggest and brashest icons that New York ever produced. All of that changed the morning of Tuesday, September 11th, 2001. After the first plane hit the North Tower, FDNY 10 House, the firehouse near the base of the buildings, sounded an alarm, meaning massive casualties. Within minutes, the fire department would transmit a third, fourth, and fifth alarm. The Port Authority, the NYPD, and the FDNY summoned thousands of first responders to the World Trade Center. Fire Captain Jay Jonas was the lead officer of Ladder 6. He was in his firehouse in nearby Chinatown that morning, where he could see a plume of black smoke cutting through the blue sky over Lower Manhattan. His truck loaded up and drove towards the World Trade Center. And uh, as we're going across Canal Street, heading west and south to go to the World Trade Center, 
I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I saw the, uh, the North Tower of the World Trade Center with large gaping holes in it, and smoke and fire coming out under pressure, and, I, and I, it, it looked, it almost looked uh, surreal, you know, that uh, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. But while firefighters rushed to the scene of the crash, the rest of the country went on with their day. In some ways, our response to 9-11 was doomed from the start. The day began with a collective failure of imagination from both the American public and those in power in Washington. At first, few thought the attack was terrorism. It's a good reminder of how different our world was before 9-11 just how truly innocent America was, back when mass public terror was a rare and new phenomenon. Now we live in frantic and chaotic times. Our news feeds, televisions, even our friends and family are constantly warning us about the latest health, climate, or terror scare. This fear of the unknown, this fear of public spaces is embedded in our day-to-day -day lives. So embedded that it's hard to imagine what it was like to live in 2001. The Oklahoma City bombing and the Columbine shooting were fresh on everyone's minds. But those were rare, and nothing of the scale of 9-11 had ever occurred in the continental United States. And America wasn't used to being afraid on a day-to-day -day basis. Matt Waxman worked in the White House on the National Security Council. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking back to you know, th that, that day itself, 9-11, and I remember the, the, the senior NSC staff meeting where the National Security Advisor kind of goes around the, the, the situation room talking with each of the, the senior directors. And you know, the kinds of things that were on our plate that day were a, a crisis brewing in Macedonia involving NATO. There was indications of a possible crisis brewing in, in Burundi. We, we, were, we were not thinking about direct attacks on the United States. After the first plane hit, millions of people in New York City looked up at the sky and millions more across the country turned on their TV sets or found the scenes playing across their morning shows. I, should, I don't mean to interrupt the fun, but uh, <laughs> this is a breaking news story, a serious news story. What? A plane has crashed, oh, hold it, into the World Trade Center. You're kidding! The World Trade Center is on fire. <gasps> which is the, the Most thought the crash was an accident. Welcome back to Good Day. These are live pictures for you right now. A tragic accident apparently has just happened in New York City. A plane has crashed right into the World Trade Center. You can see the smoke and the flames coming out of the shattered windows. I've always thought that the 17 minutes between the first two plane crashes is the most fascinating moment of the entire day. The Port Authority, which ran the World Trade Center, thought the incident would be confined just to the North Tower. At the Fuji Bank offices in the neighboring South Tower, some employees even started to evacuate, but they heard building-wide announcements to return to their desks. Everything was under control. In fact, many employees sat and watched the raging fire from their sister building across the plaza, which had not yet been hit. Below, nearby ferries kept taking hundreds of people to and from Manhattan, even as a cloud of smoke grew over the Hudson River. Peter Johansson was the director of operations for the New York Waterway commuter ferries. He pulled into the Wall Street port at the tip of Manhattan under the shadow of that first tower ablaze. We continued on. We were taking the passengers to Pier 11 for Wall, most of the Wall Street jobs. There was 100 people on board and every one of them got off and went to work. The occupants of the North Tower remained largely clueless. The internet was in its infancy. There was no social media. Many felt an explosion of some sort, but didn't realize a plane had hit their building. Or if they did, they assumed, like much of the rest of the country at home, that it was a small one. On the upper floors, some people headed for the roof. They expected that they could be evacuated there. But the Port Authority had, without telling building occupants, changed its policies and locked the roof doors. 
Other employees above the crash in the North Tower called emergency responders, who told them to wait in their offices for evacuation. Fire department 408, where's the fire? Yeah, hi, I'm on the 106th floor of the uh, World Trade Center. We just had an explosion up here. What building are you in, sir? One or two? One World Trade. Yeah, there's smoke and we had about 100 people up here. Sit tight. Do not leave, okay? There's a fire or an explosion or something in the building. Just sit tight. All right, just sit tight. We're on the way. All right, please hurry. Firefighter Jay Jonas and his team had arrived at the base of the North Tower. They were walking over broken glass and metal as they entered the lobby. You could see that there was uh, large pieces of uh, this, uh, some sort of masonry decoration on the, the walls of the lobby, and uh, they were knocked off the walls. Uh, the glass that surrounded the, the exterior of the North Tower of the World Trade Center um, was broken out, and the reason why that happened was that when the plane hit, the building flexed, and the entire building flexed, but those things that were attached to ground couldn't flex, and they broke. So all those windows that were in the perimeter of the building, they were out. They were gone. By the time his unit Ladder 6 arrived at the base of the towers, their job had turned from putting out a fire into a search and rescue mission. You know, there's, there's an old saying, a building on fire is a building that's under demolition. You know, whatever's resisting gravity is being attacked by the fire. And uh, so that's like the, uh, um, the backdrop of every fire that we go to. Our role in that situation was search and rescue. And uh, that's what we're going to do. We were going to go upstairs and save as many people as we could. As the FDNY made it to the North Tower, air traffic controllers had also lost contact with the other flight bound for LAX, United Airlines Flight 175. That's the same plane you heard about earlier, the one that checked in with ground control while the first hijacked plane was still in the air. But Flight 175's cockpit had been quiet since then. Controllers worried that the airliner had also been hijacked. Now, Flight 175 was careening off course and headed directly into the path of another plane. Delta 2315, Delta 2315, turn left immediately to a heading of 200. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's in sight. Okay, you can maneuver as necessary to avoid that aircraft, sir. I do not know what he's doing. Delta 2315, any evasive action you need to take is approved. Well, turn immediately, 200, don't point to Roger, traffic, 1 o'clock, 10 miles, turning into your face, descending out of 31. It's a hijacked aircraft. We don't know what he's doing. Sitting in his seat on Flight 175, passenger Brian David Sweeney tried to call his wife at 9 a.m. At 9.01, the plane dipped toward the Manhattan skyline. Yeah, hi Sam. You see a guy, look, is he descending through the building also? He's descending really quick too, yeah. Well, that's... Well, he's 500 feet now. He just dropped 800 feet in like, a, like one, one sweep. That's, that's another situation. Another one just hit the building. Wow. Wow, another one just hit it hard. Another one just hit the world fate. The whole building just uh, came apart. Oh Holy smokes. Captain Jay Jonas and the rest of Ladder 6 were waiting for orders in the lobby of the nearby North Tower. Uh, all of a sudden, I saw a large black shadow on the ground, and we saw pieces of flaming debris falling down outside our building. I didn't know what that was and uh, until a man came running in from the outside and said a second plane has just hit the, the South Tower. And uh, the lobby turned very silent, and um, 
one of the firemen from Rescue One looked up and said, uh, we may not live through today. And we stopped and we took, we acknowledged his, uh, his statement. And we said, you know what, you're right, we may not. And uh, we stopped and we took the time to shake each other's hands and wish each other good luck. It's good knowing you. It's great to see you. Hope I see you later. And of all those guys I was surrounded by when the second plane hit the South Tower, I'm the only one that survived. They all died. Jay's plan was to climb the building 10 floors at a time. They would send survivors down while they made their way to the fire on the 90th floor. But a new reality set in when the second plane hit. Jay and the millions of people watching the attacks all had the same sudden realization. This was an act of terror. This was an act of war. But, uh, I, you know, you just can't conceive of that kind of evil, you know. But once the second plane hit the South Tower, now we knew we were under attack. We were at war with somebody. We didn't know who we were at war with. And uh, I went over to where my guys were. They were standing about 30 feet away. And I said, all right, guys, here's the deal. It's a raw deal, but this is what we have to do. And so we have to go upstairs in this building for search and rescue. And we can't use the elevators because they've been exposed to fire already. And the last thing I told them was they were, uh, they're trying to kill us, boys. Let's go. To their credit, they all said, all right, Cap, we're with you. And uh, off we went to uh, the B stairway of the North Tower. Even as it became clear that a terror attack was underway, few watching the towers burn expected them to collapse. That was because until then, no skyscraper in the world had ever collapsed after a fire. That simple fact is worth repeating. Before September 11th, no skyscraper in history had ever collapsed due to fire. But planes had hit buildings before. In 1945, a U.S. military B-25 bomber had even slammed into the Empire State Building after the pilot got lost in the fog during a routine mission. The plane crashed into the 78th and 79th stories at a speed of about 200 miles an hour. It smashed through seven walls. Blazing petrol set 11 stories of the building on fire. No one knew what had happened. The wildest rumors spread through New York. But firemen were on the job, and in very quick time, they had the fires out. In fact, the resulting blaze, the highest one in the world up until that moment, looked eerily similar to the Twin Towers decades later. On 9-11, as firefighters climbed the stairs, FDNY leadership marshaled in the lobby of the World Trade Center's North Tower. They assumed they could rescue the people trapped above the plane crashes, and that the fire would eventually burn itself out by destroying the tops of each building. This would be tough, but the fire department of New York was the best and bravest in the world. So that Tuesday morning, they prepared for an hours long rescue operation, followed by what they thought would be a days long firefighting marathon. By this point, the NYPD, the Port Authority and FDNY had called thousands of first responders to the World Trade Center. It was the largest emergency response in the city's history. So why couldn't they have rescued more people from the towers? Even though first responders had a plan, they were hobbled by communication problems that ultimately doomed many trapped in the burning buildings. Arriving emergency personnel found their radios difficult to work. It was a challenge that the FDNY had been warned about for years. One issue dated back to the first attempt by Islamic extremists at toppling the towers, the 1993 car bombing of the World Trade Center's basement. Then, NYPD helicopters were able to rescue some stranded victims via the Twin Towers roof. But that emergency response got bogged down. Too many firefighters, too few radio channels. The World Trade Center's concrete walls blocked signals, and fire officials didn't have any way to easily contact other agencies or the building's occupants. To address some of those concerns, Mayor Rudy Giuliani decided to build an emergency operations center for all of New York City. And he placed it, astoundingly, in the heart of the World Trade Center complex itself. That meant that when the planes flew into the towers on 9-11, the city's emergency command hub, 
which was meant for exactly this situation, was rendered useless instantaneously. The rescuers struggled to coordinate their response. Everyone that day, from firefighters and police officers to air traffic controllers, were all inundated with calls from victims, witnesses, and each other. Across the city, across the country, they repeated parts of scattered or false information on the attacks over different channels, again and again. Firefighter Jay Jonas. You know, the, uh, the radios functioned as they were designed to function. They were designed for a limited range. They're, they're designed so that, you know, if you have a fire on one block and you have another fire three blocks away, that they wouldn't interfere with each other. To overcome that at the World Trade Center, they had a, um, uh, a repeater system set up. But when the plane struck the North Tower, it took out the repeater system, it took out the standpipe system, it took out, you know, uh, all, the, you know all the infrastructure that's, in that building to help us fight the fire. You're very dependent upon building systems in high-rise building fires to fight the fire. And that plane strike took those systems out. So firefighters were effectively out of communication as they climbed the stairs of the North Tower. Many had no clue what was happening on the ground. No one had any idea just how close the towers were to falling. Unlike the 1993 attack, the NYPD helicopters that circled the World Trade Center on 9-11 quickly realized they couldn't evacuate those trapped inside anyway. Both towers were too engulfed in raging fire, with smoke and heat rising from the burning jet fuel. But the NYPD helicopter pilots did manage to get a warning to their colleagues on the ground. They told them that the top of the towers were glowing red and looked like they were on the verge of collapse. Unfortunately, that message didn't also go out over FDNY frequencies, which would have given firefighters a few precious extra minutes to evacuate. Here's FDNY Fire Chief Joseph Pfeiffer speaking after the attacks. We didn't have a lot of information coming in. Um, we didn't receive any reports on what was seen from the helicopters. What you saw on TV, we didn't have that information. The 9-11 Commission later found that, quote, the FDNY and NYPD each considered itself operationally autonomous. As of September 11th, they were not prepared to comprehensively coordinate their efforts in responding to a major incident. But despite all of those challenges, the city's response could have been successful. Just a week before the attacks at a conference in Germany, lead architect Leslie Robertson boasted about the Twin Towers. He boasted they could withstand a strike from a Boeing 707, a smaller plane than any of those hijacked on 9-11. Here he is speaking to PBS years after the towers fell. It has in it a steel frame. Uh, but that steel frame uh, was designed to carry all of the loads that the designers thought would be on the building. They were wrong by a significant margin in terms of the magnitude of the loads. And so even though the steel frame was in fact not adequate to carry the loads that, that would in fact go on the building, the system which consisted of the steel frame and all of the masonry in the building was quite strong enough to do the, to do the job. But if that's the case, then why did the towers fall? And how did they collapse? The fact is, despite their reputation, the towers were not physically prepared for an attack like September 11th. There were fatal flaws hidden deep inside the World Trade Center at its birth. The construction industry was in flux in the 1960s and 70s as the towers rose. The industry was moving away from fireproofing with asbestos. By 1970, just three years before the World Trade Center's dedication, the city ordered contractors to stop using it as insulation. So the bottom 36 floors of the North Tower, the first of the complex to be built, were constructed one way, with heavy asbestos fireproofing covering the steel beams that made up the core of the Trade Center towers. But on all the floors above that, along with all of the South Tower, those floors were covered with new mixes, 
mixes that weren't up to stuff testing-wise and turned out to be applied poorly. The towers were owned by the Cross-State Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. That meant that the World Trade Center didn't have to comply with the New York City building and fire codes. And the violent impact of the planes dislodged the fireproofing material and exposed the building to their eventual downfall, searing, burning jet fuel. Another factor the building's designers hadn't properly anticipated. Instead, they had been using that 1945 Empire State Building crash as their guidepost. They assumed that any plane that crashed in New York City would have been landing there and would have burned off most of its fuel. They didn't imagine a fully loaded transcontinental flight at the start of its journey. And they didn't imagine tons of burning jet fuel gushing over entire floors across the Twin Towers' mostly open floor plan. The B-25 that crashed into the Empire State Building, it carried just 800 gallons of fuel. American Airlines Flight 11, the plane that struck the North Tower on 9-11, had 10,000. Still, the National Institute of Standards and Technology later found that the towers likely would have stayed up if it weren't for the coating that became dislodged and exposed the underlying steel beams. Few watching the towers burn or climbing their stairwells knew it. But the World Trade Center was already doomed. Just before 10 a.m., Jay Jonas and his team were still climbing the central stairwell of the North Tower, Stairwell B. We felt and experienced something that nobody ever felt or experienced before. Uh, we heard a loud noise outside, and our building started to sway violently, so much so it was, it was hard to keep your feet. In my research for my book on 9-11, The Only Plane in the Sky, one thing that stuck out to me was how witnesses and survivors described that sound of the Twin Towers falling. We've seen skyscrapers fall in movies and TV shows, and we're desensitized to the destruction through the spectacle we make of it. But those who heard the towers fall on September 11th struggled to find words and metaphors to describe a sound no human had ever heard before. Here's some of what they said. Deafening, like an incoming missile, an avalanche, like 30,000 jets taking off. It's a sound that grainy videos of the day and even this podcast can't do justice. At 9.59 a.m., the South Tower collapsed. This is as close as we can get to the base of the World Trade Center. You can see the firemen assembled here, the police officers, FBI agents, and you can see the two towers. A huge explosion now raining debris on all of us. We better get out of the way! Firefighter Jay Jonas felt the collapse from the nearby North Tower, which was still standing. And uh, I looked at Billy Burke. I said, Billy, go check the south windows. I'll check the north windows, and we'll meet back here and see what we found. I went to the north windows, and I couldn't see anything. You know, I just saw white dust pressed against the glass. And uh, so I went back to the stairway and uh, waited for a... Billy Burke to come back, and he, he was coming back, and uh, he had a funny look on his face. And I, says, I asked him, is that what I thought it was, thinking that a piece of our building may have just fallen off? And he just looked at me and he said, the South Tower has just collapsed. Knowing what that meant, that thousands of people w were probably just killed right next door to us. And uh, so I... Uh, I looked at my guys from Ladder 6, and I said, all right, guys, if that one can go, this one can go. It's time for us to get out of here. So uh, we're going down the stairs, and uh, we're going down at a normal gate and, um, until we got to the 20th floor. And uh, once we reached the 20th floor, that's when uh, we ran into a woman standing in a doorway, and she was crying. Uh, her name was Josephine Harris. 
and uh, she, w she was a bookkeeper for the Port Authority. She was a temporary employee. She had made it down from the 73rd floor with the help of one of her co-workers, but the co-worker left and, and left her there. We didn't realize it at the time. It was She wasn't walking well, but she had been involved in a uh, car versus pedestrian motor vehicle accident uh, a couple of weeks prior. Tommy Falco turns around and uh, looks at me. He says, hey, Cap, what do you want to do with her? And <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, you're being pretty free with our time. You know, that every second that we waste is one second closer to us not getting out of this building. And, uh, but then I looked at her and um, I said, all right, bring her with us. You know, she was helpless. And uh, I told uh, Billy Butler, it was one other one of my guys, says, Billy, take your mask off, give your tools to the other guys and put her arm around your shoulders and we'll continue down the stairs. But we got to stay together, which is what we did. Jay and his team slowly escorted her down the North Tower stairwell B one step at a time. They would sometimes have to stop and move to the side to let the long jam of people behind them get through. Again, the clock is ticking in my mind. You know, it was the uh, the spooky music in the background that, you know, like the monster was about to poke his head out. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we were just trying to beat the monster. Jonas started to calm down as he and the rest reached the fourth floor. He knew they were close to getting out. He thought this tragedy was, for him, almost over. But then Josephine fell, and now she said she couldn't walk anymore. She told the firefighters to leave her behind. Jay wasn't taking that for an answer, and he started desperately searching for a chair or surface to carry her the last few flights of stairs. I got about three or four feet away from the stairway door, and it starts. The collapse of the North Tower with us still inside. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I've had uh, people question me about that, and they say, well, when did you get out of the building? I said, I didn't get out of the building. And they, they, that information goes over their heads. I said, no, no, when, when did you get out of the building? He says, I never got out of the building. He says, you know, there was a building when I was in it, it collapsed. <laughs> so, like, I, I never, we never did make it out of the building. And, uh, which is something that uh, people have a hard time wrapping their heads around. Less than 30 minutes after the South Tower fell, at 10.28 a.m., the North Tower of the World Trade Center also collapsed. Oh, my God, there it goes! Jay Jonas, his firefighting team, and Josephine Harris, the woman they were helping, were now trapped under the rubble of the North Tower. You'll hear the rest of their story later this season on Long Shadow. That day, after the collapse, Manhattan was swallowed in a thick brown cloud of debris. By the time that dust cleared, some 400 first responders from dozens of city, state, and federal agencies plus thousands of citizens who couldn't evacuate in time, were dead at the site we now call Ground Zero. For an attack that changed all of our lives, there's still a lot we don't know about 9-11. Maybe you remember the story of United Airlines Flight 93, the only plane that didn't reach its target that day and crashed instead in a field in Pennsylvania. But where was it headed? And what was the hijacker's intended target? Um, I'm, I'm speculating, but clearly we know the plane that crashed outside Pittsburgh was headed for Washington. I think the Washington part of the attack was significantly interfered with. Long Shadow is a production from Goat Rodeo and Long Lead. You can find it wherever you get your podcasts. Go ahead and rate the show and leave us a review. It helps spread the word. I'm your host, Garrett Graff. Long Shadow's lead producer is Max Johnston. John Patrick Pullen is the show's executive producer. The episode was written by me and Max. 
Story editing from Morgan Springer. Editorial support from Dan Eisner, Diana Albasha, and Owen O'Carroll. Senior producers at Goat Rodeo are Megan Nadalski and Ian Enright. Rebecca Seidel is managing producer. Music from Blue Dot Sessions and Ian Enright. Podcast artwork by Emily Crawford. Longlead's creative director is Natalie Matuszewski. And a thanks to ABC, CBS, NBC, PBS, C-SPAN, and the 9-11 Memorial and Museum for some of the archival audio you hear on the show.